everything in a mother's power to save my child. A crisis that has spanned generations. We don't want her flame to go out, so we're trying everything we can to keep her name and face out there. Now in a Facing Race special report, how Washington is working to address the startling number of missing Indigenous people in our state. It was really important to us to make sure that our counselors were tied to their Native communities. And bringing closure for families seeking answers about missing loved ones. I refuse to let the hopelessness be all the conversation. Hello, I'm PJ Randawa with the King 5 Facing Race Unit. This year, we made a commitment to take a deeper look at the epidemic of missing and murdered Indigenous people in our state. From families who are suffering in silence to groundbreaking initiatives challenging the status quo. Data shows Washington has the second highest number of missing Indigenous people in the country. And this year, a statewide alert system was launched specifically to bring attention to some of those cases. But before the alert system launched, we learned many Native American families have had to put together their own safety systems to protect themselves. They call it the plan. In the Echo Hawk home. I personally believe in like a cultural and spiritual call to doing this kind of art. Each stitch. I did these handprints in the color of the native medicine wheel. Each shade. Red is the color of prayer. Comes with a story. It's also a symbol of the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls movement. And sometimes a reminder about the plan. These kids along with my own, they know that if their aunties or their mom ever went missing, that we would never have left them on purpose. It's a plan Abigail Echohawk of the Seattle Indian Health Board says every Native woman she knows has had to make what her family should do if she were to disappear. They would need to um, make sure that somebody looked for us. For my children, they know that my handprints are on the dresses. They know that they would be able to take my fingerprints to the police. Do you ever remember not knowing about this? No, we can be in danger People get lost by not telling people where they are and not being careful. They don't come home and you don't get to be with your family anymore. Here in Washington, Indigenous people are going missing or being murdered at the second highest rate in the country. Seattle itself ranks as the city with the highest number of cases nationwide. According to the Seattle Indian Health Board, compared to white women, Indigenous women in Washington are four times more likely to go missing. Right now, state patrol records show 126 Indigenous people in the state who aren't accounted for. Research has shown us that the primary perpetrator of the acts of violence against indigenous women and girls are white men, predominantly white men who come onto reservations or target indigenous women within urban settings. With fewer resources, Native American families are forced to take matters into their own hands and form plans for their loved ones. I have actually posted something on Facebook. If I ever go missing, know that uh, I didn't do it on purpose. Come look for me. I love my family and friends. I wouldn't just disappear. Nana Bluen has spent the past two years looking for her own sister, 39-year-old Mary Johnson. Mary was last seen on the Tulalip Reservation on Thanksgiving 2020. We don't want her flame to go out, so we're trying everything we can to keep her name and face out there. Mary's sisters, Nona and Jerry, believe she may have been a victim of human trafficking. Yeah, what do you tell your kids about where she is? I just say, um, Aunt Mary's trying to find her way home. And uh, my little, our eldest daughter, she goes like this all the time. You know, and, and she's like, um, Mom, can we email the chief and ask where she is? <laughs> Mom, why are they looking for her? You know, how come she's not home yet? She can't be that lost. And I, I don't want to tell them that she's missing. So that's what I tell them. Fire Trail Road. This is the road what Mary was seen walking on the day she went missing. We believe that she trusted somebody, got in a vehicle, and has never been seen since. 
Tulela Police Chief Chris Sutter sees Mary's case as a continuation of what's been happening to Indigenous people in America for centuries. Historically, the wrongs that have been committed, including abductions and murders and rapes and all, all forms of sexual assaults and, and other types of abuses, have gone unpunished and unprosecuted. This has been perpetuated for centuries. And it's because of that history, Chief Sutter has talked to his own children about the plan. My children have all heard dad preach to them, be aware of their surroundings and their situation and don't trust people. So I wanted to do this in honor of the families. Back in the Echo Hawk home. Do you guys know that? We would never leave you. Mm -hmm. Abigail hopes future generations won't need to prepare for their own abductions or murder by having a plan. Having a plan is part of the hopelessness that's experienced by our communities. It's not something any of us should have to do. Until then, Abigail creates hope from unlikely sources, like these flowers on her latest art piece. And really thinking about every single person as a blossom, as beloved life. When the Seattle Indian Health Board asked for PPE during the pandemic, the federal government sent them these body bags instead. How many body bags do you have? Got like 22 left. 22 body bags? Now Abigail uses them to create art that highlights the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women. One of her works made from these body bags has even been featured in Vogue. My artwork is a form of healing. She's also now using them to keep the traditions of her culture alive for the next generation. It's cool because most people are not able to be a part of the culture. The thing I love about it is that for these kids, this is just who they are. It's going to be pretty. Creating hope and beauty from darkness. There is hope on healing the past so that we have full healing for our community so their children's children don't experience the same things that I did, that they did, where something like this is never out of a body bag again. I refuse to let the hopelessness be all the conversation. Last month marked the two-year anniversary of Mary Johnson's disappearance. The FBI is offering a $10,000 reward for information leading to an arrest in her case. If you have any information, please call the FBI's Seattle Field Office at 206-622-0460. According to the Urban Indian Health Institute, the city of Seattle has the highest number of missing and murdered Indigenous people of any city nationwide. In May, I joined a family searching for their loved one and saw firsthand the obstacles they face in finding answers and getting help from law enforcement. Just want to say prayers. We go into there. The scent of burning sage carries a prayer for the Bull Hill family. As we start this day, we just ask Creator to help us to find Shalina. For four days, the search for 31-year-old Shalina May Bolthill If she's in here, we want her to see you. has led her family and advocates to several homeless encampments. You guys here today? I see you all the time. Yeah? The Idaho native moved to Seattle with a boyfriend in 2017 and soon lost touch with her family. I think that she got into the drug scene. The last couple of messages she had left her dad were just absolutely unbelievable. They didn't make any sense. About a year ago, he stopped getting any messages, any calls. Wednesday, the family got their first glimpse of Shalina after more than five years. She got pockmarked all over her face. Watch out for needles. The unhoused that live here call this area near the I-5 and I-90 interchange the jungle. It's one of Seattle's long-standing encampments. She screamed and said, this lady's crazy, uh, help. Uh, but then, I don't know, a few seconds later, she turned around and told me she loved me. <laughs> um. <laughs> Can you guys wait right here? Can you all recognize Bree? Roxanne White, founder of the grassroots organization Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, People and Families. That's what they're saying, King Street and then over there by Yesler again. Has a unique understanding of what Shalina and her family are up against. I used to be homeless and I used to be, I, I'm a trafficking survivor and I was out on the streets and I know the kind of things that happen out here and I know firsthand just what I survived and I can't imagine, um, and then I can, which breaks my heart to know that she's walking around with no shoes, 
and that she never wears shoes. Seattle police tell us Shalina is not considered missing. In an email, police confirm they've had prior contacts with Shalina over the years and even made a past referral for evaluation. This child, this woman, this young lady is incapable of even asking for help. So that leaves the family to bear this burden on their own. The heartbreaking thing is, is who do we call? I mean, there's nobody to call. Uh, there's nobody to come aid us. There's gaps in this system. Do you know where she might be right now? She's around. She's around? Is she in this camp right now? Uh, last time I seen her was on that road. As close as the searchers get, Shalina remains just out of reach, much like the resources they desperately need to get her home. Last year, an out-of-state tribal court granted Shalina's mother guardianship over her so she could be committed for treatment. However, an Indigenous rights lawyer tells us it's unlikely the tribal order is enforceable in Washington. I've done everything in a mother's power to save my child, and I've fought against the system now for a while, which means my, my words mean nothing to them, and that's not okay. It's not okay. A plea for help that Roxanne, a once missing Indigenous woman herself, hopes to answer. I think it's so important that we try to come in and do what we can so that she doesn't become one of our uh, MMIW that never makes it home. This is why I survived everything. This is why I survived. It was to help other families. The day after this search, Shalina Bolthill was finally located by her family. She was admitted into a treatment facility for mental health and addiction issues. Advocates tell us she's now reunited with her family and living in Idaho. The three digits advocates hope will someday be as memorable as 911. Just ahead, how Washington is tailoring the new 988 crisis hotline to support Native people. Also, new technology being used to help save lives and spread awareness. The first of its kind alert system now in place in Washington State. It's a startling statistic. According to the Center for Disease Control, Native Americans have the highest suicide rate of any race. Washington State is now the first in the country to address this issue with a new mental health crisis line specifically designed for Indigenous callers. We sit down with the crisis line's manager to find out more about this critically needed mental health resource. I'm here with Rochelle Williams, the Tribal Operations Manager for Volunteers of America. Rochelle, thank you so much for joining us. Tell me about this hotline. Why is there a need for a Native-specific crisis line? So the Native and Strong Lifeline is an American Indian and Alaska Native specific suicide and crisis line. Uh, this also includes other mental health support needs. Uh, the reason that we have a need for this is because American Indian and Alaska Native people have the highest suicide rates of any racial or ethnic group in the country. I believe this also includes Canada, but we know for sure in the United States that is the case. And there are a lot of unique things about this hotline, yes. um, including the counselors. Tell me about that. So it was really important to us to make sure that our counselors were tied to their Native communities. This doesn't mean that every counselor is an enrolled tribal member like myself. I'm an enrolled member of the Ahadasat First Nation, uh, Northern Vancouver Island, BC. I'm a descendant of the Tulalip tribes, but they are closely tied to their Native communities. We know in our families that not every person will always be enrolled, and that is because of tribal sovereignty, and it depends on the constitutions of the tribes and what the membership rules are at the time. So all of our counselors, though, are connected to their Native communities, and they know their families. They know historical and intergenerational trauma. They understand what their communities need. That is important to us because as Native people, and for a good reason, we don't have a lot of trust. It's important for us to know that the person on the other end of the line, when it comes to something as serious as mental health and needing support, especially in a crisis situation, that we know that person has a basic understanding of who we are already, foundationally. They don't have to know every trauma that we've experienced. They don't have to know our families. They don't have to know everything about our lives. But we do know that we share some of those uh, deep-rooted collective traumas. And so that part is out of the way. It can be exhausting to discuss these things with people that don't know. 
And so it's really nice to know that they already have that. So you have that level of comfort and almost a familiarity with the other person, just knowing that they're indigenous also. Um, the hotline recently launched. What's the feedback been like so far from callers? Yes, so our hotline launched very quietly on November 10th. Um, we wanted to launch when 988 Nationwide launched in July. However, we wanted to be really, really intentional with our work. And so we wanted to make sure that we had a dial pad option so that when somebody called in, they could easily press for and be connected to the Native and Strong Lifeline. We've had a pretty steady volume of calls, which we were concerned about, right? We wanted to make sure that our people trusted us and how can they without hearing from others that it's a real thing, right? And so we've had good feedback. We've had steady calls. We are operational 24-7, 365, just like the regular Lifeline or 988. And we've had, you know, some really positive reviews with callers saying, thank you, I'm glad that you're here. I can't believe that this is actually happening. And we hear a lot also in the communities too. My own community and other communities, we understand that this is really important because people are talking about it around us. Can you believe we actually have this thing, right? And it's a part of something huge. It's not just another 1-800 number. We can press four just like the veterans press one or the Spanish speaking people press two or the LGBTQ community presses three. Native and Strong Lifeline is press four. That's really important to us. We're putting first people first. Yeah, that recognition is so important. It really is. Um, and it sounds like other states are taking notice. Tell me about that. Yes, and we are so excited for that. So what we're hoping for is, I don't want to call this program a pilot program, as I've heard. I want to call it a model. Other states are taking notice. There are other tribal populations that are huge. I'm thinking of Oklahoma and New Mexico. And those two states have actually reached out already, saying, hey, we have this. Um, we've heard about you, we want to do something similar. And we want to do that. We don't want to be information hoarders. So we are willing to share that with everybody else. Well, Rochelle, thank you so much for spending some time with us today and letting us know about this really important crisis line. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, PJ. I appreciate it. The 988 Crisis Hotline is staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can connect with a trained counselor by calling or texting 988. Native callers can then press 4 to reach the Native Crisis Hotline. You can also chat with a counselor online by visiting 988lifeline.org. Still to come here, it's a crisis unfolding right before our eyes. With some of the highest numbers of missing Indigenous people in the country, Washington's new specialized alert system is already saving lives. Washington's newly formed Missing and Murdered Indigenous People Task Force is recommending state leaders set aside funding to start a cold case unit focused on unsolved Indigenous murders. The task force found that of the roughly 2,200 recorded unsolved homicides in Washington, just under 5% involve an Indigenous victim. Well, Indigenous people make up less than 2% of the state population. The Attorney General's office has so far been able to identify 113 unsolved murders involving Indigenous people. As we've mentioned, Washington and Seattle specifically lead the nation in the number of missing Indigenous person cases. There are currently 53 missing Indigenous teens and 75 missing Indigenous adults listed with the Washington State Patrol. The majority of cases were initially filed with tribal police departments across the state. The Yakima area had the highest number of missing persons reports with 36 cases. The oldest case goes back to 1971. Earlier this year, Washington launched the Missing Indigenous Person Alert, which is similar to an Amber Alert. Families and advocates say in the past, their missing persons cases weren't getting enough attention from the media or police. Now, six months after the system's launch, we take a look at how it's making a difference. Since launching in July, the Washington State Patrol's new Indigenous Alert System has issued close to two dozen alerts. So that alone to me is a success because we're able to get out and educate and raise awareness to the issue and the, and the problem and the reporting uh, stumbling blocks that families encounter. According to WSP, of the 22 missing Indigenous person alerts activated since July, 
16 people have been found alive. One person was found deceased and five people remain missing. I would say the vast majority are runaway uh, youth. Most of the time they're staying with other kids or staying in, in a shelter somewhere and just haven't found their way back to family members. And that's what we hope they all end like. Program coordinator Carrie Gordon says at least 15 law enforcement agencies received training on the alert, but there are still many more agencies that aren't aware of the resource. Well, I think the example that we had that came to us last night is a perfect example of um, where family felt like law enforcement wasn't taking the case of their missing um, uh, young adults seriously. It was just a lack of education with regard to the ability to activate the missing Indigenous person alert. That detective, she just did, didn't know about this. And once we educated her, she's sent us all the information we needed. But we're still seeing, you know, that imbalance of, of, of not all cases, not all jurisdictions um, or counties are utilizing the MEPA alert system. Just want to say prayers. We go into there. Roxanne White is an activist who helps families of missing and murdered Indigenous people. Watch out for needles. Well, she says the alert is a welcome resource. She believes more needs to be done to bring those missing home. I've encountered several um, missing persons cases where officers have come into contact with a missing individual and the only thing that by law they have to do is tell them do you know you're missing you should contact your family and that's it they could be experiencing trafficking exploitation domestic abuse there's a huge gap in the system. Trust me, I, I have adult children and I can understand and I have compassion for family members that are frustrated. But unfortunately, it's there is no other you know, ability for us to tell family members where their loved one is. It's a privacy issue. They do have the right to be missing as an adult. Gordon encourages families with missing loved ones to contact her team directly for help raising awareness and navigating police jurisdiction issues. We're a small group. We're subject matter experts now in this entire program, which is, I'm really proud of that. So when you call and you reach out to the state patrol regarding a missing person alert, you're going to get one of four people who do this full time. This is their job and it's their focus. So far, several states, including Colorado, California, and New Mexico, have reached out to WSP to learn more about launching their own Indigenous alert systems. You can also sign up to receive missing Indigenous person alerts. Just text the word ALERT to 206-448-4545. That's all our time for now. I'm PJ Randawa. From all of us at King 5, thank you for watching.